I'm David Hamilton from the Department of Energy, and um, my background is basically nuclear power, yeah, fuel cell systems, and electric power systems. And for the Department of Energy, that's mainly what I focus on is new generation power systems. Well, the critical thing now that I think everyone's missing in energy is that we have designed a world that feeds on oil. And those oil supplies are becoming limited, more and more limited. Uh, just the other night at the vice president debates, they talked about the problem in the United States with higher prices had nothing to do with the oil, but in the ability to process that oil. And at 12 million barrels a day, which we passed in July, that's over 7,000 barrels a second. It's a tremendous number. It's hard for people to fathom how much oil we're using. Now, if we look at what supply is, never before in our history have we been in a position where supply and demand would intersect. So we've basically been operating as a monopoly for oil. It's, it's a free product. And now, in about 10 years, we will see the intersection between supply and demand. So that means we'll be su seriously supply limited. The other things compounding that, and which we have seen lately, the recession in Asia showed a, a, a worldwide slight depression. Uh, we were slightly isolated from most of that, but now they're coming back, and again, world prices are going up because demand's going up. And we're going to see that become even worse. I've got some curves I brought with me to demonstrate this, but if you look at where the Asian and, and the uh, the Chinese market uh, people are in technology compared to where we are, where the UK is. They are about our 1920s technology level. When they move up that curve to try to have as many cars as we have per capita, the demand for oil will be astronomical because right now the industrialized nations are only 20 percent of the total population. Our requirement, the 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 funding from individuals, the funding from governments is necessary to get the ideas out, to get these people that are thinking outside the box, beyond oil, to begin to supply the ideas and to get the scientists working on those ideas to wring out all the problems that we have with these technologies in a timely manner instead of them sitting on the fringes for long periods of time. Well, there are some things I know about and some things I can't really talk about because, um, but I do know that there are tremendously impressive weapon systems and, and, and energy, potential energy systems, but I don't, I, I'm not, I don't have access to really study them. Uh, the only ones I have had study, I've had the fortunate nature to study things before they were classified. And in that nature, I, I learned a lot about some of the weapon systems because of my quantum mechanical background. There are a lot of technologies that have paths that you can follow through the literature that suddenly became non-published and you can track publishing records up to a certain point and then they just disappear and you can also track people's backgrounds to know that they were working for a company or they were working for under a government contract during that period and it seems odd at times why were they no longer publishing this seemed to be a passion at one time but now they're not publishing in the in the public forum so I believe that there were some things developed. Um, I've talked to quite a few people around the, the country and in Russia as well that have seen some, some very novel technologies and want to develop them, but they continually have difficulties in trying to do that. Now, historically, if you look at uh, technologies that have been rather uh, toward the nature of what people would describe as free energy machines, uh, not requiring oil, but high voltage or other types of applications that seem to get more yield than you would get otherwise. Similar to a nuclear power plant, you put very few watts in, but you get a lot of watts back out. But these energy systems <coughs> have historically had problems. You may be familiar with, uh, was it Murray? Uh, his experiment uh, was around uh, was the First or Second World War, I can't remember the exact time frame but it was destroyed, all of it was lost, and his son never really understood the full concepts of what he was doing, so he hasn't been able to reproduce the work. And uh, similarly, 
with working with the Russian universities, they had done uh, what I consider one of the best gravitational experiments ever done was at the High Temperature Materials Laboratory in Russia. Now they had done their experiment off-site and they demonstrated that that thing could develop 35 percent reduction in the gravitational field. Now we saw that, we were very impressed with it. The, grav the uh, I have gravitational researchers at DOE and I had them look at it. We were all interested in doing that. We'd like to follow up on that to do a second type of, of experiment. It's duplication, uh, re reproducibility, getting back to the issues of how do you do good science. But you run into a lot of resistance against people. But in the Russian case, it was even more so. When they, had, uh, when they were away from this off-site laboratory, it was across the street from the university as I understand it, the place was completely ransacked. All the equipment was lost. Now, lucky for us, they had their recordings, they had their videotapes, they had their presentation materials, all of that was still intact. But the machine was lost, and as well as a lot of the other equipment necessary to, to duplicate that test. It may have been that uh, there were some mafia-type individuals that were involved, uh, thinking that there might be some profit in this thing. It was clearly too early. There was much more science that needed to be done. The reason I was contacted was to develop the theory behind why that was working. And um, I guess the last thing would be the government folks. And my Russian friends say that the part of the government that does that is no different from the mafia. So, mm -hmm. so that complicates the problem. But even further beyond that, we have to, we have to completely get away from oil as, an, as a fuel because it won't be there in the multiple generations behind us. And if we care about humanity as a race we want to extend, we have to do this. Now, through my work in theory, we've been able to show that, in, well, I'll give you my first opinion, that Einstein made a, one mistake that he didn't realize, but human nature makes it a mistake, and that was special relativity. The reason is because special relativity explains things in a very simple way for most of the things we see in nature. It doesn't account for gravity, it doesn't account for gravitational anomalies, it doesn't account for any space-time curvature whatsoever. So that, I believe, is the reason why general relativity never got, I would say, fixed from his terms. It, it needed more, uh, more intense graph. Uh, graphical treatment, a more intense algebraic treatment in order to explain it properly. Now, we're currently doing that, about 150 scientists around the world working on higher topology mathematics and higher topology geometric structures that will help explain that and they do explain many of the anomalies we have today. There is potential from these systems that we may be able to coax nature to reorganize. And some people might call this vacuum energy, but energy is all around us. If we, matter is energy. Uh, everything in this room causes space-time curvature because everything comes from energy. Energy causes space-time curvature. What Einstein showed in 1917 was that a planet causes it, but we also know by E equals mc squared that there's a, a relationship to the energy. So if we were to look at the energy, it's, it's around us everywhere. A lot of it is very unorganized. We need to make that energy coherent. And that's what I feel that the vacuum energy might offer us. How do we capture that energy, focus it into what we want it to work on, and then provide us the power for whatever we need to do, if it's going down the road, listening to a radio, whatever it is. Now imagine if, if it's true that we can use electromagnetic fields and adjust them in such a way that they either decouple us from gravitation or they may, say, create an, a negative gravitational effect, which some astronomical uh, folks feel that already we see negative gravitational effects from long-range parts of the universe, which we feel that may be explaining why the universe is expanding rather than contracting. But again, if we can take advantage of these locally, and we can do it without using tremendous amounts of energy, possibly using the other energy things we were talking about earlier, the freer energy concepts, the vacuum energy. Then we've got a way to move material in the z-plane really efficiently and also with no pollution. 
And that is really critical. I think that technology in itself is critical because as this population grows, this, this little planet gets smaller and smaller. And, uh, you know, when you look at LA's projections in 2050, 50 million people. I mean, right now, you have to ask, where are they going to go? It's, we have some serious problems to face. The other side of the coin on energy issues is the amount of carbon we throw into the atmosphere. Now, this has been a, an important aspect of what the Department of Energy has worked toward, is to try to get cleaner fuels, to, to work with EPA, to work with other people, to, to try to reduce the amount of carbon. And we can, we can see the effects by the turtle population, sea turtles that get it, uh, they have to be in warmer waters to get certain kinds of fungus. And those fungus growths are becoming more and more prevalent. We see it in the coral. The British government released, as well as Greenpeace released, about coral damage. We know that bleaching happens only because of either thermal or exposure to air. And in some of these cases, they weren't exposed to air, so it must be the thermal currents causing these effects. And then we've had a record amount of ice fall off from, from both the ice shelves. Uh, so these are, these are troubling. Uh, they, they, I mean, a 100-foot rise in water is probably not tremendously concerning to most people. Uh, but if you live under 100 feet, you'd be pretty concerned about that. <laughs> the, uh, the other problem of how to do that is, is, is really challenging because if you look at what we've done in the United States, it's focusing on just ACE, you know, just, just the U.S. And what the Europeans are doing is focusing on just them. And again, we get back to the issue, we're only 20% of the population. We've already used half of the available known fuel. And now we're looking at the other 80% of the world coming up using those same technologies. And as Tom mentioned earlier, we might well get into a, a carbon density that could be irreversible. And there have been quite a few papers talking about exactly where that is. It may not be a very calm transition that, that most people expect. It may be a catastrophic change. And that really fits with the fossil record. There haven't been really calm changes during extinction phases. They were catastrophic changes that ended up killing large populations. I think it's going to take a worldwide effort to get around these problems. It's, it's going to take an effort that divorces everyone from fossil fuels, fossil-based fuels. Trying to find every aspect, every avenue we have to create the electricity we need for most of our applications in very clean ways. Now, in order to do that, it's going to take a tremendous effort now, spending that money by the countries is not a bad thing. It, it creates high-tech jobs. And over the long run, I believe we will create a lot of high-tech jobs. I think this is a good thing for the world. It's a good thing for people. It's a good thing for this human race. And we need to start doing it now before it's too late. And uh, I am concerned that if we don't do something very soon, that as, again, we, we saw in the debates, uh, the vice, pres pres vice presidential debates, any society that begins to be resource limited begins to eliminate the problem stemming that resource limitation. And I would hate to see us get into the position or other people come into the position to want to eliminate us or we have to eliminate them in order to continue our lifestyle. And that's why it's so important that we start now. Uh, here at the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, one of our main interests is exploring the possibility of uh, tapping or mining this vacuum fluctuation energy, zero point energy. By the way, we call it zero point because even if you froze the universe down all the way down to absolute zero, where most motion would be frozen out, uh, this energy would still be there. It's a very fundamental kind of energy.